Today is the day we're encouraged to remember something. Something which should change our perspective and inform our behaviour. Friday the 11th of November was Remembrance Day and today or the day this message is to go out is Remembrance Sunday and both of those are opportunities to remember the sacrifices of those who've given their lives to preserve our freedoms. Well, when I was a child, the focus uh, seemed to be much more on World War II. That war had ended only 22 years before I was born, and my granddad had fought in that war. So while I was a child, there was still this sort of sense of disdain and distrust of Germans and Germany in the air. And there are, of course, various humorous nods to those attitudes if you watch Faulty Towers. Um, I don't know what words were said to me as a child um, or who said those words to me, but I understood that um, I was meant to remember what a terrible waste of life that war had been and that it was essential that we did remember what had happened to ensure that it never happened again. Well, Remembrance Day and Remembrance Sunday have a broader emphasis now extending to those who've given their lives in various conflicts, armed conflicts around the whole world and to the supporting personnel um, and to those currently involved in and affected by armed conflicts. But the principle of remembering is the same. There's something significant to remember and remembering should shape our current thinking and actions. And as Christians, we've got a Bible full of significant events to remember. And those are the things that should be profoundly shaping our current thinking and actions. And by remembering, by looking at, by recalling and meditating on and thinking about those things is one very effective way that we can apply Romans 12 verse 2 to our lives. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Well, I want to focus on two significant events, both of which God's people are told explicitly to remember. One from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament. From the Old Testament, the Exodus, uh, to be remembered and celebrated at, uh, in, at the Passover feast, for one thing. And the crucifixion of Jesus, to be remembered and celebrated, particularly at communion. Well, the Exodus is arguably the most significant event that God's people are called to remember in the Old Testament. Out of compassion and his mighty power, God delivered his people out of slavery in Egypt. And one way Israel was to ensure that they remembered this event was by annually celebrating the Passover. And as they recalled what had happened, particularly on that final night in Egypt, when the angel of death passed over them, they would remember lessons of faith and of obedience, how they put the blood of a lamb on their doorposts, how they closed the door behind them and how they hid inside until the danger had passed. They had believed in God, they trusted him, they obeyed him and through that he saved them. And they would also remember the awesome and fearsome power and judgment of God, the death of all the firstborn in Egypt that was necessary in order to secure Israel's free freedom and release from slavery. So remembering that profound night would help them discern God's character and understand their own identity and their relationship with him. And when the Ten Commandments were given through Moses in Deuteronomy 5, God introduces himself as the Lord, their God, who rescued them from the land of Egypt. And the next chapter, Deuteronomy 6, reminds his people again of the Exodus as God warns them not to forget him when things go well for them in the promised land. Deuteronomy 6.12 says, Be careful not to forget the Lord who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. So when things are good, when you're experiencing peace and prosperity, remember these things. Remember these events so that you remember who God is and what he's done for you. Don't forget how you got here, who you are and whose you are. Remember, remember the God who saved you.
remembering remembering who God is and what he's done for us shapes our attitudes and dictates our actions in very practical ways as we see in Deuteronomy 15 Deuteronomy 15 verse 15 says remember that you were once slaves in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you that's why I'm giving you this command and the commands that God gives them in that chapter are all about treating foreigners with respect with dignity with kindness cancelling debts being generous towards the poor and needy taking good care of those who want to continue working for you and releasing those who want to go free. God says to his people, do these things because you remember that you were in exactly the same vulnerable position as these people are. And at that time, God showed you mercy and kindness. He had compassion on you and he cared for you. He used his strength and his power to rescue you and provide abundantly for you. We can see clearly from this Old Testament example that God's people were told to remember significant events of the past in order to inform and shape their current thinking and behaviour. And in the New Testament, the major event we're especially called to remember is the crucifixion of Jesus. The costly sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, which bought our freedom from tyranny of sin and death. God has given us a very special and practical way to remember that sacrifice. Before his arrest, Jesus met with his disciples for the Last Supper and told them how to remember him using the symbols of bread and wine. Paul tells us how that practice was passed on to him, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, The cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So Jesus makes himself the focus of the symbols of bread, of the bread and wine. This is my body. The spotless lamb given for you, sacrificed, broken, crucified for you. And this is my blood, which seals the new covenant, guaranteeing your deliverance. Do this, eating and drinking them, Jesus said, to remember primarily me. We're to remember Jesus, who Jesus is, his character, his attitudes, his words, his teachings, his actions, and especially the way that he gave his life for us on the cross. We should also Take note that there is now a new covenant between God and mankind. A new covenant, well, a covenant is a solemn and, bind, a solemn and binding agreement between two parties. This one's been sealed by the blood of Jesus. Jesus said, the cup is the new covenant in my blood. We need to be aware that that new covenant now exists. It's now in operation. It's live. And we need, we need to know the terms of that covenant. I heard about a person recently who, and it might have been two people, I don't remember the details properly, but a person had uh, been awarded $10,000 or pounds because they'd read through the fine details of the terms and conditions and uh, the company had embedded in those terms and conditions uh, and right near the end uh, some information to contact them to receive this prize of ten thousand dollars or pounds um, and I think it was the first one or the first two people who contacted them would receive that and uh, they were the first person uh, to do that and receive that money see terms and conditions are things we often don't r read through we don't bother with but if we do there can be a prize particularly if what we're looking at is the terms and conditions of the new covenant that God has instituted through the death of Jesus. The terms of the old covenant were that by keeping the entire law that was given through Moses, you and your future generations would be blessed. And the terms of the new covenant are through repentance and faith in Jesus as Saviour and Lord, you will be saved by God's grace and reconciled to God. And that's a simple statement, but we need to unpack it and understand it so that we can live in it and reap the benefits of it. 
when we repent of our sins and receive Jesus as Saviour and Lord for the first time, we're forgiven, we're cleansed from our sins, we're saved from the consequences of our sins which had earned us eternal condemnation from God. We're declared righteous by God, we're changed, we're transformed by the Holy Spirit, we're born again, we're given a new heart, we're embraced by God and we're adopted into his family, we're granted eternal life. That's how we enter into the new covenant. But after that initial connection's been made, after we've entered into the new covenant agreement with God, we need to continue living under the conditions of that covenant. God's continually faithful to his part of that covenant agreement, but we also need to continue keeping our part of that agreement. We need to always remember uh, that Jesus is our saviour. We're not our own saviours. We've done nothing to merit our forgiveness or to earn the love or approval of God. He did it all for us while we were still helpless and deserving of his wrath. And we need to remember that Jesus is still and will always be our Lord. We no longer belong to ourselves. We can't do whatever we want anymore. We now have to submit our wants, our plans, our desires to Jesus and to live for his glory, not for our own selfish advancement. Jesus taught that the whole of the old covenant law can be summed up by these statements. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and love your neighbour as yourself. And in, and in, and in John 13... 34 to 35, Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another. As I've loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. So if you've remembered that Jesus is your Lord, if you're, then you're loving one another. That's how you're going to be known as a disciple or follower of Jesus. If you're a follower, he's your Lord. If you're a disciple, he's your Lord. If he's your Lord, you do what he said. If you're not loving each other, then one of two things must be true. Either you've never been Jesus's disciple, he's not your Lord, or you've forgotten that he's your Lord and you're not following him right now. John tells us that we can't separate loving God from loving each other. 1 John 4, 7 to 8 and verses 19 to 21 say this, Dear friends, let's love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever doesn't love does not know God because God is love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love hit their brother or sister whom they've seen cannot love God who they have not seen. And he's given us this command. Anyone who loves must loves God must also love their brother and sister. The essential aim of both the old and new covenants is the same, that we should be reconciled to God and that we should fully love him and genuinely love each other. Now, just the means of that has changed. Under the old covenant, it was to be achieved by living according to the details of the law. All the instructions of the law were ways to demonstrate love for God and demonstrate love for our neighbours. And in the new covenant, demonstrating love for God and neighbours is achieved when we live by faith and when we live by the spirit, when we live in fellowship with Jesus and obedience to him. In that way, we embody what's at the heart of the law. The detailed terms and conditions of the old covenant no longer apply to us. They've been fulfilled by Jesus, but they're also fulfilled in us if we live by the Spirit. So here's a really important thing to remember. Jesus is the one who has fully satisfied the law for us, so don't turn back to the old way of doing things. The danger is that instead of living by the Spirit, we try to live by the flesh. Instead of trusting and surrendering to Jesus, resting in his finished work on the cross and letting his Spirit lead us and enable us to love God and love each other, 
We take control of our lives back and try to live independently of him. We start judging ourselves and we start judging others by the terms of the old covenant instead of seeing ourselves and others in the light of God's grace as those covered by the undeserved and unmerited righteousness of Jesus. And that kind of thinking is a disaster. It leads to all kinds of chaos, misery, broken relationships, and it can only end in death. And these are all the things that the sacrifice of Jesus has rescued us from. So we need to remember, remember the terms of the new covenant and how to live in it so that we can live in it and we can fully enjoy all of its benefits. Let me read you some selected verses from Romans 8 and then we're going to look at Galatians 5. So this is Romans 8, 1 to 2, 5 to 8 and 9 to 14. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone doesn't have the Spirit of Christ, they don't belong to Christ. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the Spirit... You put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. There's some wonderful, powerful encouragements there, but I want you to notice particularly that phrase in verse 12. We have an obligation. We're obliged to do this. That means we have to do it. It's a necessary thing necessary for a child of God, necessary if we want to live. And what is it that we're being told we're obliged to do? We're obliged, these verses say, to live by the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit of God, rather than by the flesh or the sinful nature. And that's the choice. Live independent of God, following your own sinful desires, the flesh, and be judged under the terms of the old covenant, or submit yourself to God, be united with Jesus, let his spirit lead you, and be set free from the terms of the old covenant. In Galatians 5, Paul explains that for all Christians, there's an inner battle going on, and we need to make the choice to live in and under the new covenant terms and conditions. Galatians 5, 17 to 18, for the flesh desires what's contrary to the spirit and the spirit what's contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other so that you can't do, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law. We need to listen carefully to verse 17 because it says exactly the opposite to what our culture would tell us. It says you can't do whatever you want. Remember, remember the new covenant and how it works. Verse 18, you're not under the law if you're led by the Spirit. That means you're still under the law if you're not led by the Spirit. In other words, if you're doing whatever you want. The terms and conditions, the demands of the law state that those who break the law should be punished and that punishment is condemnation and death. You only avoid those conditions and come out of the old covenant agreement into the new if you live according to the conditions of the new covenant, which is that you no longer live for yourself. If you read the whole of Galatians 5, and I, I strongly encourage you to do that, you'll find that there are consequences of living by the flesh, and there are consequences of living by the Spirit. 
the results of either way of living are like symptoms and by observing those symptoms we can diagnose the cause or see how we're living. The most obvious symptom of living according to the flesh or according to our sinful nature is that we find we are out of sync with other Christians. We find ourselves at odds with them. We find ourselves envious of them, jealous of them, getting angry with them, hating them, causing divisions. And when that starts to happen, we need to diagnose our own condition and recognize we're not living by the spirit, but by the flesh. And we're probably doing that because we've forgotten the terms and conditions of the new covenant. Jesus said, Matthew 6, 14 to 15, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. The new covenant is clearly conditional. Did you see those conditions there? If you forgive others, God will forgive you. If you don't forgive them, God the Father will not forgive you. The condition is we receive Jesus as Saviour and Lord, and he's only Lord if we obey his command to love one another. And that includes forgiving them. We can't embrace the God. We can't embrace the grace of God if we're not willing to extend that same grace to others. The grace of God is unmerited. You can't earn it. But it's not unconditional. You have to do something to receive it. Before you call me an heretic, a heretic, let me really explain that principle with an illustration. I want you to imagine a person who's drowning in the ocean. Perhaps they didn't heed the weather warnings. Let's say they thought they knew best and they set out in a small boat in spite of the best advice given by the Coast Guard and their boat got smashed to pieces in the violent waves. And as they desperately hold on to a broken piece of the boat, a rescue team's on the way to save them. They don't deserve to be rescued by that team. They haven't earned their rescue. They didn't pay anything for the helicopter or its equipment or for its crew. But the Coast Guard sent them anyway. They're help this person is helpless, needy and undeserving. But the opportunity for rescue has been made freely available to them anyway. And that's how the unmerited grace of God works. So they can't earn their rescue but they still need to do something to receive it. When the strop has been lowered from the helicopter on the high line, they need to place it over their head and under their arms so that they can be lifted out of danger. They need to put their faith, their trust, their confidence in their rescuers. That's how faith, trust and surrender to our Saviour Jesus works. That's how grace is conditional on our responsiveness. Grace can't be earned but there's something we have to do to receive it. John puts it like this, 1 John 1, 8 to 10. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we've not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. That's conditional. We're only forgiven and purified from all unrighteousness, if we admit our sins and confess them to God, if we throw ourselves on the mercy and grace of God so that we can receive it. So when we celebrate communion, we recall the rescuing work of Jesus. We remember that we would have died without his intervention, that we would have perished if it wasn't for the mercy and the grace of God. And having embraced that grace, we don't want to go back into the treacherous waters of our own sinfulness ever again. We want to live forever in that grace. We want the river of God's grace to flow freely over us, into us. But we can't have that unless we're also willing to have it flow unhindered out of us. And so at communion, we, as we remember the conditions of the new covenant, we examine ourselves to ensure that we're still lining up with Jesus if we're surrendered to him, if we're living by the spirit, if we're loving others and therefore loving God, we may need to forgive others and we may need to let go of the hurt that we're harboring against them. 
We may need to ask God to forgive us, to cleanse our hearts and renew his love for others in us. We may need to recall that we don't need to and can't earn God's love and ask him to help us to accept his undeserved rescue and boundless grace towards us. So my prayer is that we never forget what and why we are remembering.